Hello church, um, my name is Grace and today I'll be reading 1 Corinthians 12 verse, uh, verse, oh, 12, verse 12 to 31. Unity yet diversity in the body. For as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body through many are one body, so also is Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into the into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink one of spirit. So the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. Because if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the, whole, if the whole were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But now God has placed the parts, each of them, in the body, just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? Now there are many parts, yet one body. So, so the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor can the hand say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary. All the more, those parts of the body seem to be weaker are necessary. And those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we close these with great honor. And our unpresentable parts have better presentation. But our presentable parts have no need of clothing. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there will be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has placed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, next miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, managing, and various kinds of languages. All apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all do miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in languages, do all interpret, but desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. Kids, if you'd like to head out for Kids Church, that's happening. If you're um, new to the church and you've got children, if you just want to take them up and to the left, Kids Church happens in the building across there. Uh, If you need a parent's room, it's down the back on the right. Uh, TV's on down there if you don't want to miss the the sermon. Welcome again to church. Thank you, Grace, for for speaking that uh, portion of the chapter that we're working on. Uh, We are in Corinthians and we're in chapter 12. And we've been looking at uh, spiritual giftings. And we're looking at spiritual giftings in relation uh, to worship. Uh, since Jess and I have gone into ministry, I think we've, we've changed to about six or seven different houses in, in the number of years that we've gone into ministry. And I've gotten pretty good at um, putting a flat pack together. That's kind of my father flex, is I know how to put an Ikea pack together fairly well. Uh, but something I never do when I, when I do them is I, I rarely will read the instructions. And I always find myself having to undo half of it and then put it back together again. And then even when I do read the instructions, half the time you know you've got those, those screws left over. And you're just like, I don't quite know where they fit. And every time that we've packed down and then repacked it back up, there's another screw missing. And I'm getting to the point where I'm like, when is this bookshelf just not going to hold anymore? Um, This morning we're looking at 1 Corinthians and we're looking at godly worship and and that worship that we have when we we come together, it's to be done in a way that unites the believers together. Um, It's not meant to feel like my IKEA furniture where we're wondering, is this thing going to hold and stick together full of fear, wondering if the parts are going to break down, but God has actually designed this church, the local church here, in such a way that he has brought each other together with their different spiritual gifts, with their different ways of worshipping according to the spiritual gifts that God has given them for his glory and for your betterment. We don't have to live in fear like, is this thing going to work? It's going to work because the Lord's in charge of it. And he has appointed his people within the church to do 
their work in the ministry that he calls them to. We saw that last week. Not only does he give you your spiritual giftings, but he also gives you your ministry. And so if we are working in the ministry according to his giftings that he's placed upon us, it will be fruitful. You know, Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to be fruitful. You don't have to fear whether you're going to be fruitful or not. You will be fruitful when you walk in faith according to him. Because we're going to be kind of preaching on what we looked at last week when, when uh, one of our elders, Stephen Bjorkin, spoke, I just wanted to remind you of a few, a few things about spiritual gifts. If you've come to church and you're like, I have no idea what he's talking about, I'm just trying to grasp my head around Jesus, we believe that we come into relationship with the Lord through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ offers us forgiveness of sins. We don't try to kind of gain our way to God up some moral ladder where we've worked a good things in our lives and all of a sudden we've attained to God. We believe that God came down to mankind. His name is Jesus Christ and he died in our place. He took our sins upon himself. He took the punishment that we deserved. And now we who believe by faith in his message are now set free. We are made righteous. We are made right before God. But on top of this, the Lord gives us through the Holy Spirit giftings to work, again, for his glory and for the good of one another. So we're given spiritual gifts, they're called. Now, they're called spiritual gifts because uh, they're gifts. Just like our salvation, we don't work for it or earn it. We don't work for or earn our spiritual giftings. It's not like, hey, this week you get tongues, next week you'll get prophecy, and next week blah, blah, blah. It's not like this hierarchy thing where we kind of, you know, get more accolades put on. So they're giftings. The Lord gives them to us. Secondly, they're spiritual. They're given by the Holy Spirit. They're not acts of the flesh. They are us stepping in faith according to the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, spiritual giftings will never curse against the Lord. They won't do anything against God or God's holy people. They work for him and for his people. They don't curse and bless. And lastly, there are many gifts, but they all work for the same goal. And we saw that last week. They work for the good of God's people. This week, as we look through our, our sermon title this morning, I'm sorry, I've totally forgot to do slides. I'm sorry about that. But our sermon title this morning is Godly Worship Unites the Body. Together on Sunday morning, what there should be is there should be a unity and a growing unity and a growing love between the brothers and sisters. And we're going to see in four points. Number one, we're going to see that godly worship accepts the many various gifts that he gives unto his people. Number two, that godly worship functions as God designed it. He set it up. He designed how it's going to work. Number three, ungodly worship happens when we dishonor other gifts. And number four, godly worship desires to hear from God. But I'm going to pray and then we're going to move into the text. Father in heaven, all we want to do is hear from you. And so I pray, Lord, that your word that you have given to your apostles, that you gave to the apostle Paul, Lord, would be spoken in an old faith. Father, that people would know you more. Father, that they would revere you more, that they would step in faith more according to your will and your way that you have already expressed to us through your Son in these last days. And so, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would be a blessing to the people. I know that you will be a blessing to them, but I just ask for you to communicate clearly and effectively. In your name, amen. Okay, read with me in verse 12. It says, For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body so also is Christ. So Paul is now going, okay, I'm going to teach you how spiritual gifts are supposed to work in the church, and I'm going to use an illustration for you, a metaphor for you, on the human body. Let's look at the human body, and then I'll show you how to get, how spiritual gifts are supposed to work. And then in 13, he says, for we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. So he says, look, in the human body, you've got Many different parts, but it all makes up the one body. It's easy and clear enough for us all to understand. But in 13, he says, let me show you now the spiritual reality. Every believer has been baptized, if they believe in Christ, by one spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they all belong to one body, to one church. This means that any division, whether that be racial, whether that be social, whether that be generational, whether that be over whatever it might be, 
cannot belong in the church, and if it does belong in the church or it is in the church, it's because the church is unspiritual. It's operating in the flesh. That's the issue. And then in 14, he concludes what he's saying, and he says in 14, indeed, the body is not one part, but many. He's saying, look, there is one body, but appreciate the fact that there are many parts to a body. And so our first point is this, that godly worship accepts the many gifts because he's talking about spiritual giftedness. As we've already noted through our time, pretty much the whole time through Corinth, the big nail that Paul's trying to hammer is there's division and factions in your church and it is completely ungodly. It is completely unspiritual. And now there's many reasons for why there's a lot of factions inside this church. Again, a lot of them are racial and social. But there's also a division that is happening or cliques happening over spirituality. I'm more spiritual than my brother or sister. And and that would be easy to get because if you've got a kind of cool spiritual gift, right? I'm a bit more elitist than the other one that's got one of those poverty spiritual gifts, you know? But there's one spirit and the one spirit does not divide against himself. So I want to point out again that the Holy Spirit... It's not, uh, it's not a magic, it's not like Star Wars, it's not the force, you know, it's not this thing that we wield, it's a, it's a, it's a person, to him. So when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, Christ gives the Holy Spirit, his presence to you again in the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8, the Spirit is Christ. He is the one who is with you, and yes, he is powerful. Yes, he is almighty in that sense, and he's able to perform things, but it's not a power, it's a person. And that person was poured out at Pentecost. Therefore, a godly spiritual person operating in the Holy Spirit brings unity, not division, because that's what Christ does with his bride. He brings unity to the bride, not division. Does that make sense? What Paul sees happening is this division over spiritual giftedness, which is the complete contradiction. And he's trying to unite the church back together, showing them how they are all meant to operate with each other. And I think that this division is quite a a tangible reality for us today in the church. It was about three years ago, I was sitting there and I was talking to a bunch of other denominational pastors. And and I remember just, I always feel this weirdness, just to let you know, for some reason there's always a weirdness with other pastors you kind of always weighing each other up and sometimes I get really over it. I'm just, I just want to trust you and your doctrines and your theologies. And years gone past, doctrine was what churches split over a lot of the time. People went into their churches based on, on their doctrines. But you don't see that happen really that much anymore. I, I don't think most people go in and go, give me your 12 confessions of faith to the church before I start attending. Right? Most people go, oh, the pastor's likable and you know, there's a couple of ministries that run and it's good for my kids and that's why I'll attend. But what a lot of churches I've noticed do or will fracture over in between these denominations isn't so much their doctrines all the time, but it will be because of their, their spiritual gifts, the ones that they want to highlight or excel in and the other ones that they don't want to give credence to. For instance, some will hold teaching in a high regard but to say talk in tongues is like a blasphemy to them. And so what you'll see is that the gift of tongues doesn't happen in the church because the other one's so pushed out in high regard. The same can happen. Some churches will be like, oh, it's all about the miracles. You know, it's all about the healings and so on. But they might not care about so much doctrine and teaching or prophetic word and stuff like this. And so it can get kind of heretical in the way that it goes because it doesn't value the other And it happens in all forms. You reject musical gifts or miracles, prophetic words, healings, teachers. You know, even people go, I don't like organized, you know, religion, Christianity. Well, God gave the gift of administration to be organized. So when we downplay them or when we say, oh, they're not really, you know, they're not important. We're actually hindering the growth of the body. We're making it worse. We should accept all the different gifts that the Spirit of God Brings. And I wanted to pause quickly just to affirm the list that was read out last week. And the list was read out just from the passages where we were last week. That this is what Paul says is happening in their church at that time. He says this, There are different types of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. So God is deciding, okay, this is what I'm going to have happen in my church. He says, a manifestation of the Spirit is given to each for the common good. So for some people within the church, they have a message of wisdom 
through the Spirit, and to another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. Do we believe that that gift is in the church? We do. All right, great. Through the Spirit, to another, the message of knowledge. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Do we believe that faith is a spiritual gift, that people act in their faith? Right. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Do miraculous healings happen within the church? Yes. Yeah, okay. To another, the performing of a miracle. Do people have the gift of being able to perform miracles within the church? Yes. No, that's what the Scripture says. That one wasn't as big on the yes, but okay. To another, prophecy. Are there prophets within the church? Okay, to another, distinguishing the spirits. Are there people who can discern between evil and good spirits? Yes. All right, to another, different kinds of tongues. Can people talk in tongues? Yes. Yeah, so we should have it in it. To another, interpretations of that tongue. Should we have those? Yes, we do. Okay, one and the same spirit is active in distributing them all. If we lessen off that list and say, no, nah, God doesn't work that way anymore, what are we doing? Limiting God. Right, you're taking away parts of the manifestation that God wants to bring into the church. So it's not about highlighting one or the other. It's about having them all and working together. Our godly worship on Sunday needs to recognize these gifts and allow expression within the body. Now, I'm just going to reflect on, on self here a bit. I grew up in a conservative church, and most of my life I've been in that. And I haven't ever seen in a service places where there is time allotted within worship services for the prophet to get up and speak. I'm just going to be honest or for miracles to be worked, or for healings to be worked. I've never been in that. And so where is that within the church? Because it's quite easy, I find it quite easy, to give assent to the idea, for instance, assent to the idea that there's spiritual forces. I believe that, that's biblical. Anyone that teaches the Bible has to believe in spiritual forces. But they've always been like out there somewhere. But at what point are they the reality here and now? That demons are actually around. That the angelic host is here. That the Lord Almighty by the Holy Spirit is here and he's working in and through his people. When are they actually tangible expressions that you see in the world? We must acknowledge that there is a spiritual reality and that the Holy Spirit is making himself manifest. Christ is making himself manifest through people when they exercise their giftings. Point number two, godly worship functions as God has designed it. Move with me now as we look at from 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It is not for that reason any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body as he wants it. So Paul gets a foot, and, and pretend you've got a foot in your hand, and he personifies it. He's like, give it a mind of its own, and then this foot is looking around. It's like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not like the hand. Therefore, I don't, really, I don't really belong. And the ear does the same thing to the all, eye. sorry. And Paul has in mind people that have spiritual gifts that are different, but they're like, no, but I don't really fit in with what the... The church is doing. I don't really belong to the church. So I was going to use that illustratively, and this is just an illustration, but feet is often associated with people that go and share the good news. You know, Isaiah will have that part where he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who go share the good news. Or Ephesians says, have your feet strapped and fitted, ready to share the gospel of peace. That idea of evangelism in the feet. And then there might be evangelists in the church that are meant to go out and speak, but if, if everyone else is kind of more catered to that kind of pastoral care of one another, that idea of the hand helping one another, and they walk in and they're like, oh, this church just really isn't into evangelism, it's more just into caring for the body, I don't really belong here. Paul's saying, no, that's wrong. You exactly belong in that body because they don't have evangelists in there. So we can take care of one another all day, but what about the people out there? And the same goes the other way around. A church might be primed and ready just for evangelism and they're all out there doing the great things that they're supposed to be doing. Then they all get to church and no one cares about each other. What's the point? We need people who pastorally care for one another as well. It's not one or the other. We need them both working together. Yes, you belong. That's what Paul is saying to those who self-doubt the idea that they have a gifting. Can I tell you that if you're born again, yes, you belong. And you're not just a pew sitter. 
You have something to offer the church which builds it up into the knowledge of Christ, Ephesians says. Paul says to this type of person, you can't be a foot and you can't be an eye, you can't be the other thing. Don't go after the other thing. You are what you were designed to be. Right? Oh, I'm not a good speaker or oh, I'm not very good at helping people, whatever. You were designed by the Lord to be the way that you're supposed to be, to serve in the manner that he calls you to. And that's why in verse 18 it says, as it is, God has arranged each part. Who decides what spiritual gifts that we have? God decides. Who decides in what measure they are given and how effective it will be? God decides that. Who decides which place we're going to take in church and which ministries we're going to enter into? The Lord decides that. And we are to act in accordance with the place that he has rendered unto us. This then raises two pretty serious questions, I think. On, on spiritual gifts. Firstly, how do we know our spiritual gift so that we can use it? And second, when do we know that we're operating in a ministry that isn't our spiritual gift? The answer to the first one, how do we know when we do have our spiritual gift and we're ministering in it? Look for the fruit. Is it for the common good? Does it build love? Does it build encouragement? Does it build faithfulness to God and his people in the people that you minister to? Look for the fruit. Then you'll know. For instance, if you have the, if you have the spiritual gift of acts of helps or service, do the people see the goodness of God in your work and do they glorify him? Then that's the spirit being made manifest through you for the good of his people. And the same thing can go with teaching. If you use that kind of teaching gift, do people fall more in love with the Lord and come to a greater understanding of him and how he's made himself known in scripture? Good, then you're building up the body. The Holy Spirit is present when you do it. But how do we know when we're operating out of the areas that we shouldn't be in? And the church will become frustrated. Right? It'll start to, it won't produce that kind of love for God and one another. It won't produce that faithfulness. I had a friend I was talking to about this yesterday and he said, look, I can sing. He goes, but I don't think it's going to bless anyone in the Lord if I got up and sung. I just don't think it's my gift with my vocal cords. It won't produce anything. So take, for instance, that kind of acts of service. If you get in there and you're helping someone and, and all it feels like for them is they're indebted to you or it's glorification of you. Like, oh, geez, you're just a, such a good... Maybe it's just not the spirit operating in that realm. Not to say that you can't help people. And if you're a teacher or something like that, and all you find is what it does is it leaves everyone vague, leaves everyone feeling more apart from God, not closer drawn to God, or it doesn't reveal God as he has made himself known in the word, then the spirit of truth probably isn't operating in the teaching. It will bring people in more love and in more unity towards God and towards his people. What are the fruits that are born when you minister? As a practical tip, something that really helped me, I, I never thought I'd go into preaching. I was that kid that, you know, if you got me up at school, I was already a red person, but then my face went beetroot red. I couldn't speak through my mouth because I'd just get so jittery about the idea of talking. But something that helped me kind of come into this, I guess, if you want, is, is that people like the elders and that used to affirm it in me. Not that they'd flatter me. Flattery is a lie that strokes ego. But they would affirm and say, Stephen, when you speak, I feel the Lord communicate to me. So not about me, it's about the Lord. And so affirming people in their spiritual giftedness, when you feel drawn to the Lord through someone serving you, let them know. Affirm it in them. And you know, when you worship and you sing, I really feel the presence of the Lord. You know, James, thank you so much that I still get to hear the gospel on Sundays when I'm sitting at home. You know, the Lord really works through your acts of service, and I feel and I appreciate that. Affirm those gifts in one another, because it makes you strong, it makes you confident, not in yourself, but in the Lord, that that's how he's using you. Paul concludes in verse 20. Uh, sorry, let me go back. In verse 20, yep, he says, there are many parts, but one body. So in 14, he says, there's one body, but many parts, but now he switches it around, he says... There's one body, but many parts. Uh, the other way around, sorry. Many parts, but one body. And the emphasis here is that you are your own individual with your own individual gifts, but you belong to the whole. That you work together with the greater. All parts are needed, 
and all parts support each other for the betterment of one another and to glorify Christ who is the head. All right. Where have I gone? Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we consider less honourable, we clothe these with greater honour, and our unrespectable parts are treated with greater respect, which our respectable parts do not need. So Paul now has switched his conversation. He's gone from people that are like, oh, my spiritual gift's not really valued here, la, la, la. Is it any less part of the church? No. Now he's gone the other way around, and he's looking at people that are using their spiritual gifts and going, man, I'm a really good eye. Why do I need an ear? Get out of here, ears. We don't need you. And so he's turning the whole thing around to say there's people now proud in their gifts or their particular giftings, and they're like, well, I don't need the other parts. We're fine without you. But then Paul says, but I want you to consider these other parts, these weaker parts, they're indispensable. If you remove them because of your superiority and your particular gifting, he says, look, the body won't function. You can't replace that. The body won't be able to function. In 23, he goes back to illustrating the human body by saying, we show greater honour to the parts that are more dishonourable. And we show more respect to the more unrespectable. And I don't want to sound crude, but he, he's talking about the, the genital areas. He goes, look, they're the, they're the dishonorable parts. They're the parts we, you know, we just cover up and hide and we don't talk about. But he's like, if they didn't work, we couldn't function. <laughs> they don't work, you're dead. Paul says, again, this is how God has put the church together. He has put it together that greater honor should go to the things that are least honorable. And in 25, he says why he's made it this way. Why has he made it this way? So that there will be no division in the body. Why should greater honor go to the lesser? So that no division, so nobody becomes arrogant. So no one becomes proud and is like, look how superior I am in my giftings. Why do I need that? The Lord has stitched it this way so that we will not divide against one another. Here we learn point three, ungodly worship happens when we dishonor the other gifts. Ungodly worship happens when we dishonor the other gifts. Every church has the gifts that they want to hold in in high regards and they have the ones that they want to care less for. And the obvious ones that they will hold in high regard, generally speaking, are people holding honor, the ones who teach, the ones who preach, the ones who lead Bible studies, speaking, musical worship, and those kinds of things. While things like administration or pastoral care and acts of help kind of, you know, they're the things that are undercurrent. You don't really see those things so much in the church body. Yet, I think sometimes in our church culture or our Australian culture, it can also work the other way around. Because Australia has this real big problem with the tallest poppy. (laughs) If we see someone kind of getting a bit of honor, we're like, cut that down, who are you? And so many of us actually take pride in the lower gifts, you know, the ones that have a bit of grit, a bit of hard yak, or at least I'm out there doing something, you know what I'm saying? And we despise those who have those bigger gifts, like the prophesying, like the teaching, like all the apostolic things, because it's like the boss telling you what to do, and who are you to tell me what to do? And each church, I believe, has to apply this as their church operates. Which gifts are held in higher or lesser honor? Because he doesn't say, look, these are the more honorable, these are the less honorable. He kind of just simply makes the point that you should honor the ones that are least honored. So if you pride yourself in acts of service but hold in less of the one who teaches, he says, hold that in high regard. And vice versa. Teachers, don't go assuming you're better than the people that do acts of service. Do you pride yourself in godly wisdom, sound understanding, but hold in lesser the one who performs healings and miracles? We should actually hold them in higher regard and vice versa. Do you pride yourself in mighty acts of faith and being able to perform all manner of things in Jesus' name, yet you hold as lesser the person who's administrative and able to get things organized and done within the church? Well, hold them in higher regard and vice versa. You see, we all want to prop up our spiritual gifts and think less of the other, I think, because that's the way that we experience God, right? I know for me, I I feel like I hear the Lord speak to me quite well in Scripture. I love to be able to communicate with the Lord in that way. 
And it took me a long time to realize that God speaks to other people by actually talking to them. And I was all so cynical, so cynical of people like that. God talks to you audibly in here, don't give me that. But the more I read my scripture, the more I learned that God talks audibly to people. <laughs> it's right there. And so I have to believe and trust in what the good word says, that God speaks to people, that there are prophets, that they talk. But we want to give greater honor to the ones that we have, but he says here, no, give greater honor to the less honorable ones. Our gifts should make us treat each other better, not worse. And if we treat each other worse because of our giftings, it's our unspirituality, not the spirit of God at operation. Ungodly worship happens when we dishonor other gifts. From 26 then, he moves on, and he's not talking about giftings anymore. He's talking about members. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and you are individual members of it. So Paul's switching here, and he's like, look, you guys are all members of the same body of Christ. He's, he's concerned about their emotional well-being too. Hey, if you suffer, the whole body suffers. You know, if you make people suffer, it actually hurts the whole body. You break your leg, your whole body's got to rest and wait until the leg gets better, doesn't it? That's just how the body operates. So if, if people aren't doing well in your congregation, the whole congregation is feeling that, so we all suffer with it. And likewise, if one is honored or revered, we should actually rejoice when those things happen. And it's so simple, isn't it? I was thinking about this, that's so simple. It's so easy. But in our flesh, that's just not how it works. <laughs> like, if, I, if we're going to be honest, I'll just be honest here. When, when, when someone's uh, ministry might be falling over, or maybe it's another church or something like that, sometimes the flesh in is like, hmm, why does that make me feel better? Does that not happen? Oh, I'm kind of glad it fell over and it didn't work for him. Now, if you think that doesn't happen, look at the amount of churches that have gloated over things like Hillsong or Mark Driscoll or Ravi Zacharias. They've set up whole podcasts. They make money off it and piously sit there and talk about it. Mm, yes, let's talk about it in godly ways. They're just gossiping. They're just slandering. Don't we suffer when those parts of the body suffer? Isn't that worse? But why do we relish in it? Why does the flesh want to relish in the downfall of others? You know, the Lord hates that kind of stuff, and we do this on miniature scales. But God hates that. In fact, there's a part where the Jews, the Judahites, are trying to come back to build the second temple, and their brothers, the Samaritans, is kicking them in the dirt while they're down. God just despises that fleshly nature in us. And it's also on the opposite side, too. When the people that we despise or think lesser of get honored. And we're like, yeah, that should be you. <laughs> it should be me. That's the flesh in operation, but we don't work that way. And Paul is calling us, don't operate in the flesh like that. Operate in the spirit. If people suffer, suffer with them. That's bad for you. And if they are honored, church celebrate it. Be so thankful that other portions of ministries that aren't your ministries are flourishing and growing and people are coming to the Lord. That's something worth celebrating. Not sitting there going, oh, it's not happening in my little corner. You are individual members of the same body, which is Christ, Paul says. Our last section of text now deals with the, most in, uh, the, the list of giftings of importance. So from what I read, it's not a ranking of honor, although I kind of have something to say in that in a bit, but of importance within the church. And he ranks them from, from apostle to prophet to teacher. And what you need to see in these three giftings, they're all speaking gifts. They're all teaching gifts. That's why they're so important. And I'll explain why they're so important. But the point that we learn here is this, is that godly worship desires to hear from God. You see, when we gather here on a Sunday, yes, we want to magnify the Lord Jesus. We want to worship God. But we come also to hear from God, to understand God, to know him, to actually hear him speak to us and into our hearts. And that's why everyone through the Holy Spirit, feels conviction in them. And Paul starts and he says, the most important spiritual gift that there is, the top of the rank of the list, the most important is the apostle. Now, the word apostle just means a messenger that is sent. 
So you've got the 12 or the 13 because of Paul apostles. And they are these men sent by Jesus into the world to proclaim the world forgiveness of sins and that through his death and resurrection. And now we all have a part in that too, in that we had to go out and evangelize and do those things. But the apostle is the highest because he is the one who is appointed by Christ himself to go and do the work, to establish the church, to establish the church's doctrine, to establish the church's form of worship, all of that stuff. So the only real church of Christ, and hear this, is the church that adheres to the apostolic teachings. If they don't adhere to the apostolic teachings of Paul and Peter, it's not the church. They've lost their head. They've gone to something else. Christ installed them as the highest authority in which church should operate and be structured and be adhered to. So they are the highest importance. The next one is he's got the prophets. Now people generally have different ideas about the prophets and most people just think they're they're fortune tellers. But actually their main role and job, whilst they did sometimes predict future events, their largest function and role for the prophets was that they called people back to the covenant that God had established with them. That's when they arose. Prophets would arise and come to God's people and say, God's people, you've lost it. You've been going the wrong way. That's not the covenant God has for you. Repent and turn back. And then they'd get futuristic and say, because if you don't, God's judgment's going to fall on you. And let me tell you how it's going to fall on you. But their main role was to call people back to the covenant that he had established. So the apostles teach us how that covenant's established, right? The prophets are to call us back to that. So what you should find in a prophet within the church mainly is someone saying, church, you've lost the apostolic teachings. You're not following the Christ anymore. You've been heading the wrong way. You're teaching wrong doctrine. Come back. And yes, at times, prophets will give future events. Paul sees that when someone says, hey, there's going to be a famine, so they've got to collect food. But their main job is to call people back to the covenant that God established. And in our case, it's the new covenant that he established in Jesus Christ. That's why if we start walking into a works-based doctrine or something like that, we need a prophet. You're going the wrong way. If you go into a doctrine that's like, it's all grace, we can just live how we want to live. We need a prophet. Someone please call us back. So they are the second highest in the order. And then we have teachers. Teachers are simply those who interpret scripture and give instruction to the people on what the scripture says and they do it in such a way that it helps the person in their context. That's my role. To help you understand scripture but not just understand scripture but to apply it into the lives that you have because you guys don't live like Jesus did 2,000 years ago. But because we are under the apostles, we can't teach anything that the apostles didn't teach. Because it's a false teacher. Likewise, if we do, we have to adhere to a prophet, someone to go, you preaching wrong. (laughs) And then we fall into that category. These three are the most important because they are speaking gifts. And hear this that are teaching people, and it's either leading them to salvation or damnation. That's why speaking gifts are so important. You're either getting a whole body of people and they're going the right way, or they're going the wrong way. That's why scripture will say, hey, teachers, not many of you should become teachers because you will be judged at a higher standard. Because you're leading so many people and telling them, here's the way of life. But if you got it wrong, not only do you damn yourself, but you damn every single person that you taught this was the right way. And they trusted you and they believed in you. And how dare we teach something that God himself did not teach. But something that came to me, and this is where I get kind of, if this helps, it helps, is that these labels of of greater in the ranking, the honorable and the less honorable, it sounded contradictory a little bit to me, and I think it is a little bit, but what I think I've come to is that these gifts that he ranks from first to third on the, on the prophet, on the apostle and the teacher, um, is that these are the ones that are most despised in the church. And I'll show you how I think that is. Many people want to be the teacher because, to be honest with you, it 
it's an easier place to get popular. The most popular people in churches generally are the teacher or the guy at the pulpit. But generally, in Scripture, they're popular, generally, not always, because it's false. It's praiseworthy in the world, but it's not praiseworthy by God. You go look at all the prophets that were really adorned with praise, they were the false ones. In fact, the Corinth church here thinks little of Paul as an apostle. So much so that Paul, on numerous occasions, has to defend his ministry. He's like, yes, I am beaten on the sake of the gospel. Yes, I do get put in prison all the time. Yes, so many horrible things happen to me, church, but guess what? I am the apostle. I am the one you should be trusting. I know it looks like the Lord's abandoned me, but I'm telling you, this is the way of the disciple of Jesus. He has to completely defend himself all the time. And actually, when they start to entertain the Corinth church, the super apostles, these ones that just have a really good ministry. I think people want to call themselves apostles, and you'll hear, you see it on YouTube, well, I do anyway, the little videos that come up, people that call themselves apostles. And they're not down in the dirt, they're generally highly revered, right? Honoured and adorned by everyone, making a full ministry in their own name. But this is also true of the prophet. Name one prophet of God, besides Jonah, where everyone was like, geez, that's an awesome prophet. Geez, we just love that guy. None. Jonah was the only one that was liked by Nineveh, and guess what? It was because it wasn't God's people. <laughs> Jonah's like, I don't want to preach to them. They're going to hate me. They go, preach to Nineveh, and they're all like, yep, we need to repent before the Lord. Then all the prophets go to the Jews, and all the Jews are like, shut up. <laughs> they kill him. Who really wants the ministry of prophetic word? Jesus was a prophet, got crucified for it. Paul was a prophet who spoke out against illegitimate marriage, got beheaded for it. Who really wants that gift? And lastly, the first person who taught that was an apostle within the church in the book of Acts was Stephen. Poor fellow, he preached one sermon and he got stoned to death. Who by? Supposedly God's people. So you go look at the apostle, you look at the prophet, and you look at the teacher. The people that hated them most were the people who claimed they were God's people. And it just seemed like a contradiction. You'd think they're the ones like, Woo! but they're not. So while people may want honourable positions to be a leader in the church, I don't like that word sometimes. Leader of what? Leading to where? Where are you going? Leading them to Christ? Leading to a cool thought you had? <laughs> what are you leading to? So they might want the position, but do they really want it because actually these positions are the most dishonourable? Paul looks at his apostleship and he says, hey, he said this earlier in Corinth, you guys say you reign like kings. Awesome, good for you, church. Guess what? We apostles are like the scum of the earth, despised and rejected. How I wish we reigned like you did, but we don't. Doesn't sound like a very pretty job now, does it? And I think this is why Paul says to desire the gift because anyone who truly wants to do it, yes, they will be very honoured by the Lord because they're taking up a right stance with the Lord and a high place in the kingdom, but they're going to take a very lowly place of honour in the world and among the religious. You see, most, I don't like labelling with most, a lot of people, they don't want to actually hear what God has to say. Right? And, and Paul teaches us this. In the last days, people are going to have itching ears and they're going to just want to have them scratched by what they want to hear. And that's why so few churches will preach all of the biblical counsel of Scripture. Because guess what? It's extremely uncomfortable. It's extremely countercultural to the rest of the world. It's completely different to how we normally think. Is it offensive? Yes. By definition, it's offensive. The gospel itself is offensive. It sits there and says, guess what, everyone? You're all sinners damned to hell. That's offensive. 
But the good news is in Jesus Christ, if you put faith in him, he takes your sins away and you can be forgiven and you can go to be with the Lord for eternal life. Offensive, but once you get past the offense and over yourself, beautiful, godly, righteous, gracious, merciful, pleasing. Godly worship wants to hear from the Lord. On Sunday, have we gathered together to hear from God as he has revealed himself? I hope that is true in our hearts. I want to bring our time to a close here. A godly worship unites the body. That was kind of the sermon title. You see, the objective of, of worship and using the spiritual gifts is not to be united for the sake of, of unity, but to be united under the headship of Christ. That is where our unity is. So if we don't believe the same gospel, there is no unity here. There's one Lord, there's one gospel, and there's one unity. When that becomes our goal and when that's what we're seeking, yes, we will be drawn together because that is what Christ is doing. Christ is bringing unity to his church, to those disciples who are trying to be with him. And there are religious, you know, forfeited versions of Jesus that have deviated from the apostles. And so what we can't do is we can't have unity and we can't celebrate in those areas. We can't celebrate in the religiosity of Christianity. We have no partnership in those things. We only have partnership in the true gospel that Christ has preached that the apostles have proclaimed after him. But what we can celebrate in all the diversity that there is, is that the Lord has blessed every individual in individual ways to bring glory under his name. That's a beautiful thing, that there is so much diversity in this church, that nothing is lost, that nothing is wasted, that everything is good in him who is the one who empowers us to do his work. That you can celebrate. We can celebrate in the Lord and what he's done and in the different ways that the Lord manifests and makes himself known in every believer. We can celebrate in those things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you not only save us, Lord, but you equip us, you gift us, and you call us to go work in the field with you. And Father, the church and, and the wider community, that is your field. Father, would we be people, Lord, who encourage one another, who spur one to get another on in faith towards you, Jesus. Lord, if it's, if it's just a, a, a word, Lord, if it's an action, Lord, if it's... A, if it is the, the, the greater spiritual things or the phenomena, if it's the teaching, if it's the word of wisdom, whatever it be, Father, I pray that we would go in faith knowing that we can exercise them because you called them good in the church and you make them manifest in the church. But I pray that as we look at next week, that we do it for the common good and love and unity for one another. Lord, I pray that everyone here would be encouraged to know that you have given them spiritual gifts so that we might all grow into the fullness of Christ. No pew sitters, Lord. Everyone active, everyone worth, and everyone able to do. Because you have called them and you have equipped them. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.